Welcome to the November 13, 2021 meeting of the, what is this? Mountain View Computer <laughs> Users Group. <laughs> and this is an episode of... <laughs> the mic? Whoa. The Mike and Barry Show. The return of the Mike and Barry Show. Today's sponsor is Carolyn McLean and Mia Bella's Candles. Hey guys, Christmas is only 42 days away, and now's the time to get your house smelling like the holidays. Christmas candle scents are available now from Carolyn, the candle lady. She will be at the mall at Sierra Vista on Saturday, November 20th and December 4th. You can visit her booth there and buy some holiday scents. Or you can text, email, or phone her to place your order. There's your contact info. Thanks, Carolyn, for sponsoring this episode of the Mike and Barry Show. <laughs> On today's agenda, a little club business as usual, and we got some returning members. We have some more timely tech, tech topics. Well, at least one. A little tech news, a term of the month, and tips of the month, and sharing of favorites. Today's main topic, operating system updates. And... If we can get through all that, a little general Q&A at the end, but uh, don't count on it. We have a jam-packed episode for you today. As usual, we ask you to silence your mobile devices, put them on do not disturb, turn off the ringer, whatever works for you. And if you need to take or make a phone call, please step out of the room. All right, a little business. This is where we would welcome any new members. I see all familiar faces, however, some that haven't been here in a while. So and for those of you who don't know who I am, I'm John Google, the president. <laughs> and I'm not supposed to be here right now. Surprise, surprise. Yes, yeah, surprise, surprise. <laughs> and we don't have enough time for me to list all the stuff I have. <laughs> no, just, just say one yeah. favorite thing. Okay. The um, well I, I have the new MacBook Pro Max, one at 14 inch. And I'll tell you, I have never been so impressed with a machine ever. It is incredible. Especially my favorite thing to do is I do video, 3D, photography. Things on you know, my old iMac used to take seven to eight minutes to do are now down to seven or eight. Uh, it's amazing. Like I did some rendering on 3D. I didn't tell you about this with 3D rendering last night. It used to be that I'd have to go watch TV, come back. I had one render that used to take almost three hours. Last night I did it in Blender, which, and it was in real time, real time. I, I, I could not believe it. Um, yeah, it took me four weeks to get last month's uh, thing edited into John, so it's now it's now available to watch. <laughs> uh, my name is Mike McLean, husband of Carolyn. Of course, that's probably my biggest accomplishment. <laughs> I am a Windows person. I have been for many years uh, for the simple reason that I had to make a choice back around 1992 as to what was the best gaming platform. And at that time, it was DOS. And from DOS, it was a natural progression to Windows. Unfortunately, Mac at that time, gaming was not their strongest point. Uh, still but, isn't. Still isn't. <laughs> I've, been, I've been involved with this since uh, I took my first semester of classes at Cochise College too many years ago. And my first semester was a beginning programming course with John Buno. So, yeah, it's been a long time. <laughs> what I have for us today, I have a new Surface Laptop Pro, uh, no, Surface Laptop 4, uh, that is running Windows 11. I'll be using that a little later when we talk about the Windows 11. I also have a Windows 10 uh, laptop. This is an Asus laptop that I purchased about three years ago, and I'll be uh, using both of these uh, today. At home, I have a desktop that's about seven years old, but so ridiculously overpowered, it still uh, works well. I like to do gaming, some serious graphical gaming, so I tend to buy systems that are way overpowered, and I keep them for years and years and years. Uh, replacing fans is necessary until the whole thing just falls apart, and that's what I do. Back to me. I'm also a vice president, and uh, I'm a Mac geek. <laughs> I use Windows at work, as I said last month, um, but I geek out on, on uh, Apple stuff. My favorite thing most recently on the, on the computer has to do with uh, photography, photos specifically, a little bit of video, but uh, my dad's uh, 90th birthday is coming up next month, and uh, my mom has planned a big surprise party, and so I'm... Uh, been gathering, scanning, and, and preparing 
photographs of him and his life over the years to put into a display that will be printed and you know put up in the venue for the party and as well as a slideshow that will hopefully have running a digital slideshow running in the room and that's kind of where where I'm at computer use right now. <laughs> so a little bit of graphic design, a little bit of photography, storing old photos, things of that nature. Yes, John has a question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yes, John has. Yeah, um, just curious. Um, have you tried the Colorize in Photoshop yet? Not yet, but I have some old photos. I'm gonna try that with the neural filters. You are going to be dumbfounded. What I'm talking about is Photoshop just released a new rendition that allows you to colorize black and white photos with a click of a button. And I would say it's better than 98% accurate. It's just, the demos I've seen. Look, yeah. yeah, and it, it works that well in real life. And hopefully that's... <laughs> I, well, I talk loud enough, it should. Carolyn is our treasurer, and now you can do the treasurer's report. First off, give the treasurer's report on how much money we have. We have $380.38 in checking, and... $425.21 in savings. There is a couple of deposits which come up to about just over $100 that I haven't deposited yet, so it's just a little bit more than that. And one of the things, let me just bring it up on my computer here, that I need to point out is having this room, because we pay for the room and we pay for insurance, and we also have a domain, so we have our MVCUG website and we have Zoom. All of that comes to just over $1,400 a year. And with our dues and our refreshments, we only take in about $434 a year. We spend about $120 a month. It really take in, if you average it all out, to $36 a month. And I just did the math, because being the math person that I am, <laughs> that gives us six and a half months at the current rate. So I just thought I would mention all that I gave you the numbers, that's the current rate, so I just thought I would mention that for the good of the cause. <laughs> Carolyn McLean. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Carolyn. Yeah, we're going to have to uh, make some hard decisions at some point, uh, soon. Uh, when you put up there, Carolyn being you know, sponsoring, that might be something we want to look into, is actually getting sponsors for each meeting. Um, they put up advertisements and we'll plug them. Uh, Carolyn, you're deeper into that than, what do you think? Are you still with BNC? Or I do have content. Well, why don't we get an executive session together and discuss that? Because that might be a viable alternative. Or yeah, the chamber and we can go online and check with different people. Because all we're asking for, you know, the cost, what's the cost of the meeting? 40 bucks? So we need 50 bucks. Yes. And for most companies, that's a drop of the bucket. And so, you know, they, they, let's think about that. Yeah, could be a good solution. Yeah. All right. Excellent. We have a webmaster too. Jim Emmons, the mystery man. He does not exist. <laughs> I went over to his house the other day and I confirmed that he is now a robot. He's now a robot. <laughs> Well, he does, uh, robot or not, he does keep the uh, website going at mvcug.org. So it's one of the resources for you to check out. There are links to meeting notes and meeting videos, as well as other information there about what's going on with the group and uh, all that. We have a Facebook group for anybody that's sticking around on Facebook lately. We do post uh, events for these meetings. There's not much discussion on our page, however. but. <laughs> It's there to take advantage of if you wish. Uh, other membership benefits. You can uh, check out a couple pieces of hardware. There's a film slide scanner and a projector the club owns. If you need to do some scanning or projecting. we As uh, Carolyn mentioned, we do have a, a Zoom account, a professional Zoom account, a paid account. So if uh, the free tier of Zoom is not enough for your meeting or gathering online, uh, you can use the clubs and contact John or Carolyn to set that up, provide you with a link to then send to your... And professional consultation discounts from both John and myself. Just in case, $25 per household is annual uh, membership fee. That may be going up too if we need to cover a little bit more. Our membership year is from September through August. So if you haven't paid Carolyn for the current year, she's here today. You can pay her. She also has graciously provided her contact info to mail a check or to send her an electronic pay, uh, payment through PayPal. You can see that. 
her address on the whiteboard, I think, all right. So what's coming up? Today, our main topic, of course, operating system updates. We'll be getting to that shortly. Next month, the Carolyn McLean Show. Productivity for the holidays. Personalizing your holiday newsletters. Learning mail, how to use mail merge to personalize those addresses. And uh, things to think about when sending those out, either by snail mail or by email. And then we start a new calendar year, January. Now, John, you'll be gone next month for sure, right? Mike and I will be helping Carolyn out. Taming streaming services is the topic for January. So if you're uh, into cord cutting or streaming video of any kind, even if you still have a cable or satellite subscription, this is a meeting for you to get information about what uh, is the current state of that universe. And in February, using your digital wallet. For everybody that has a smartphone with a wallet on it, there's lots of things you can do these days besides just uh, use it for payments. And if you're not using it for payments, why aren't you? <laughs> it's so convenient and so secure, so fun. Anyway, that's that. Time for Timely Tech Topics. What's in the news and tech today? Well, Mike brought us a, a uh, topic and is going to be sharing a little bit about what's recently happened. The uh, infrastructure bill and $65 billion approved for improvements in broadband. So, Mike, tell us all about it. All right. This attracted my attention because I learned not too long ago when my brother was going through his memoirs, I grew up on a small family farm. And I was rather surprised to learn that my farm did not have electricity until within 10 years of my birth. I'd always grown up with it. I didn't realize it was that recent. And it was part of the Rural Electrification Administration, which was a government program put in place to bring electricity to remote areas, farmers. Well, Congress just recently did the same thing here with broadband. They approved $65 billion in the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act or as everybody calls it, the infrastructure bill. So here's what it's going for. 42.45 billion is to subsidize ISPs to build out in unserved areas. That is defined as areas that have less than 25 megabits per second downstream and three megabits per second upstream. And they also have latency issues enough where they can't do a streaming video. There's also a subsidy for $14 billion to subsidize eligible households, $30 a month to get broadband. 2.75 million to states <coughs> for grants, <coughs> excuse me, to assist covered populations to get broadband. And that's defined as low income, racial and ethnic minorities, rural residents, veterans, people with disabilities, language barriers, and 60 or older. So there may be money coming for those of us that go into these categories that have issues getting broadband. And finally, $5.6 billion for a variety of broadband grants to build infrastructure in rural and unserved areas. And I take this to mean the areas that the ISPs aren't interested in, in order to get broadband out to the air, uh, all the areas. And this also kind of caught my attention because I know my family, who still lives on that family farm, they have a heck of a time getting broadband in that rural area when you're several miles out. I think right now they make do with satellite, which has its uh, own issues. So, but. This is uh, one of the things that's in the infrastructure bill that I thought was um, a very important topic and something that those of us in this area may want to uh, keep an eye on since this is a rural area. Uh, Barry. Thanks, Mike. We're on to the uh, computer term of the month, the metaverse. It's been in the news lately, and uh, I pulled this down from Wikipedia, but Mike's going to tell us a little bit more about it because he's bringing the term of the month this month. The term metaverse has been in the news lately because the Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg announced that he was changing the corporate name of Facebook to Meta. <laughs> and in that announcement he spent 90 minutes talking about the metaverse and how Meta will lead the way. I tried watching it and got about 10 minutes in and couldn't go any farther. <laughs> You're a braver man than I. <laughs> I got a kick out of it. The term metaverse was first used by Neil Stevenson, a science fiction author, in his 1992 uh, novel Snow Crash, which is a very good book, by the way. In it, uh, there is a virtual world that anybody can access through fiber optic network and VR equipment. And it's actually very similar to the recent movie Ready Player One, in which people live a 
second life, if you will, inside of a virtual world. And there was a game called Second Life that was very similar to this. The web magazine Ars Technica actually went through this and analyzed what he had said, what Zuckerberg had said, and came up with these common denominators that seems to be what he was talking about. So a metaverse might include a shared social space with avatars to represent users. So little cartoony type characters that you would be rep are represented by. A persistent world that the avatars can inhabit and interact, which means that anything that you do or change in that world would continue to exist even after you've left and come back again. The ability to create, own, and sell or exchange your own virtual property. I mentioned the game Second Life, which was very similar to this already, and I had a friend who many years ago was active in Second Life. And he actually was making a nice little side living, uh, creating virtual property and selling it to other people for real money inside uh, that world. And, uh, matter of fact, to the point where he was actually considering uh, doing that as his full-time job. And also it probably would have a shared universe of intellectual property from multiple major corporations. If you think that Coca-Cola is going to pass up a chance to market to people inside of a virtual world, no, they're, they're going to continue with that. And I see that we are messing up John's recording of going back and forth here. And the final thing it would re record or that it would require would be a full 3D telepresence, just meaning virtual reality. You'd use a virtual reality helmet or goggles to fully inhabit uh, this world. Uh, is this going to happen overnight? No. Is it going to happen at, at all? I don't know. We'll probably get close. I don't know how close. But this is something that all the major corporations think is viable, and they're starting to head towards it now. So Facebook kind of wanted to get out ahead of all of this. So that's why you're hearing about the metaverse now, and why you'll probably continue hearing about it in the future. Any questions? Comment. John. Um, are you aware of Facebook's entry into uh, meetings and what they put together? I'm not, not Facebook's. I was familiar with Microsoft doing HoloLens. Okay. Facebook has introduced their answer to Zoom. It's done with virtual reality headsets and avatars in a meeting room. That's about Microsoft HoloLens, too. That's too. Didn't Facebook buy Oculus? Yes. Is that okay? It uses the Oculus headsets. So far, all the reviews I've read on, I have not actually used it because I don't have the hardware. Mm. It's failing miserably. Okay? Um, by the way, the movie Free Guy, which has just been in the theaters, oh is an excellent example of the metaverse and is a very, very good movie. Uh, we are going, this is Holodeck. Mm. Okay, and the, if you, I don't know if many of you follow uh, Psychology Today, mm. but there's been very, a large number of concerns about this in which people will go in and never come out. Because <laughs> they'll have a better life inside the metaverse as opposed to outside. Mm. It's a very real concern, that's all I have to say. Except you still have to eat somewhere. <laughs> All right, Barry, back to you. The Windows tip of the month. Mike's going to tell us all about Windows Magnifier. Windows 10 Magnifier is a nice little utility I found in the Windows Accessibility tab. It enhances visibility in a window screen by enlarging visual elements. However, it also has the ability to read text aloud, which I was not aware of. And the easy way to bring it up is by pressing the Windows logo key and the plus key. So I'm going to try that. Once I remember where the plus key is on this, it's dark up here. Okay, and you can see it actually enhanced it. And, oops, I'm going to bring go out of that mode so I can actually put a cursor there and I'm going to hit read. And studio streaming and recording uh, software of broadcaster software. And let me turn that off for a second by, no, I actually don't even have to turn that off. There we go. Let me bring out my sound. Oh, that's awfully. Are you recording that screen too? I am recording everything. So, no, let me try that again. Desktop one. And I forgot that this does not work when it's in this mode, so I am going to bring up a Word document, and now... Timely Tech Topics Congress approved $65 billion dollar broadband bill. This was passed as part of the recent Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act that was approved by Congress, and includes... 
Okay, perhaps not the best uh, as far as accent goes. And I love the way that it actually does interpret the dollar sign uh, for a dollar, so which is why I wound up with the $65 billion dollar dollar on that one. Uh, but I found that this is kind of useful, especially uh, if, as I find my eyesight is going quickly. So these are little things that, that help out uh, quite a bit. Uh, I was very impressed that we now have the ability to read text without having, actually having to go through uh, very many other hoops. The only other thing I was going to mention was to turn off is the Windows logo key and the escape key. Questions? Comments? Mike, although this was Windows, and for the us Mac users and um, Kindle, a lot of Kindle books mm. you have to physically read. But I understand there's a, a method that, you, uh, that will allow Kindle to also read the text as opposed to you reading it. You know about this? Oh, like read it out loud? Right. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I don't know because I know I do a lot of Kindle and I know Amazon also sells audiobooks. Well, I have audiobooks okay. for Kindle. You don't have to read your Kindle, but it has, should have a feature to read itself also. I'd have to poke around in that and play with that, John. Yeah, you have to have the, the um, color version of the Kindle, and that is oh. an option to speak text. Hmm. And the when I used it, you'd have to tap on the paragraph and it would read you the paragraph. And you have the same capability on the iPhone. Uh, and accessibility, speak text, and you select a text and hit speech, and it'll read it to you. Hmm. And I, I do that a lot. All right, Mac tip of the month. I'm going to kind of dovetail off of last month. Uh, we talked about the Mac OS dock and the Windows taskbar, but didn't get a chance to like do any demos or anything. So I thought I might do a quick little demo about working with the Macintosh dock into demo mode. <clears throat> Here's my desktop, and you may notice there's no dock. Oh no! <laughs> As I did uh, mention last month, uh, you can place the dock on uh, either the left or the right or the bottom of the screen. I actually, on this laptop, I generally use the left side of the screen for my dock because it's a smaller screen and that gives me more uh, vertical space for whatever I'm working on. Uh, I also have it auto hiding itself. That's why it didn't appear right until I pushed my cursor to the left side of the dock or left side of the screen. So to change those um, those options, you can move the mouse right above the dividing line, which we talked about that last month. There's a dividing line between the apps and then the folders and files that you can add the, uh, to the dock as a user as well as the trash can. So if you right click on that dividing line you get some preferences right there that you can change. So I can change the position back to the bottom and I can turn hiding off if I want it to be there all the time ubiquitously. I can also turn magnification off. You'll notice when I point to an icon, it gets a little bit bigger. If you don't like that, you can turn that off from the same control. And now when I point to it, it just gives me the name. It doesn't uh, actually magnify what I'm pointing to. Position on the screen, as I mentioned, we can put it on the right as well. And it moves the uh, any icons on your desktop over just a smidge so that they're so you can see them, or so you can see the dock and, and the icons both. And you can change the minimizing animation. Let's go back to the bottom here, position to the bottom. And let me open a finder window. It's just my home folder. Uh, the yellow little circle button, the upper left corner of a window is the minimize button. And when you minimize something, it goes into the dock. In my case, it goes into next to the trash. You can have an option where it will minimize into the application that uh, is using it or that it's associated with, but I like to see it in the dock separately. That option to change the minimize to scale is uh, just changes the animation. And so instead of going that swoop -de, what they call genie effect, it just goes down real fast, gets smaller and then gets bigger again when you click on it. So those are some uh, tips regarding the dock, where it is on your screen, changing the magnification, and uh, turning hiding on and off, should you care. Close that, and I'm gonna position back to the left. I like to keep it. Any questions about 
those dock controls. There's a lot more to the dock. There's a, a system preference pane that gives you some more controls. Uh, and of course, I didn't go through how you put things in and how you take things out of the dock, but um, we will cover some of those things perhaps in a future. And now the iOS tip of the month, checking a weather map on your phone. This is going to be a little specific to the latest version of the operating system. So, uh, I'm running iOS 15 and the, uh, the default or the uh, stock weather app that comes from Apple uh, has been updated. The weather app has been uh, enhanced. It's, get, it's got some en enhanced graphics in terms of the current weather conditions in the background. It's giving you some uh, some more information here. You can scroll and you can see a whole bunch of different things. Air quality, UV index, sunset, sunrise, wind direction, a whole bunch of stuff here. But the, in the middle there is a, is a, there's a map and you can tap on that to bring a map up full full screen. You'll also notice in the bottom left corner, there's a little icon that looks like a folded map, sort of. That also will take you to the full screen map. And it defaults to a temperature map. And it gives you quite a broad uh, area around. Does this do landscape? No, it doesn't. So you can see a temperature range in color over this area from almost down to the tip of Baja all the way up into uh, north of uh, the north of Flagstaff uh, with our current location right in the middle. Um, there are other layers that you can turn on or off to, to, of uh, data if you'd like to see. And in the uh, upper right corner, you see those two uh, buttons. There's three icons. The top one's location. Show, then the second one is uh, gives you a, a list of your, cur of your uh, locations that you've added to your weather. So I have added locations for diff different cities where I have family members uh, that live. So I can see the weather conditions where they live. But this third icon down all by itself in the little uh, square is uh, looks like a bunch of square uh, kind of stacked up on top of each other. Those are layers and you can choose to see a precipitation map or an air quality map instead of. So here's a precipitation. Well, we haven't had any. So it doesn't really show any colors, <laughs> obviously. But if you notice the bottom, there is a, is a, there's a, a, a scrolling timeline kind of a thing, which you can pause and turn off. But it's going gonna, it's gonna to show you from a few hours ago or a, a, about an hour or so ago to the current time and then a little bit of forecast below or uh, beyond that. So here we are, Orlando's weather. Let's go back to the map. It's giving temperature. It looks pretty warm. Is there precipitation? They haven't had any precipitation either. Well, this is only showing uh, the last couple of hours. It's interesting. It's not It's not filling in. Oh, it's taking time to get the data overlay, but uh, there we go. So that's an animated live uh, precipitation. You can also look at air quality, and it'll zoom in closer because air quality is more, probably more appropriate to you know, where you are than over a broad range of areas. So uh, looks pretty good. A lot of green. It's a little bit of yellowish in the heart of the city there. So that's a, a fairly new to the weather app in uh, iOS, specifically iOS 15. Scroll, whoops, scroll back to where I am right now. And that's the iOS tip of the month. Good. We're getting close to break time, but we just have a um, couple more things. We're going to share some favorites. So Mike's got a favorite. He's got some software that he's been playing with. Okay, I'm not going to switch over on this one because you're going to see it uh, a little later anyway. I was looking for a decent software package to record my screen for this presentation when I do the Windows 11 demonstration. And I came across OBS Studio, which stands for Open Broadcast Streaming. Uh, it is free and open source, and it is a very, very uh, capable uh, software program to allow you to both uh, record and to stream, if you're into that type of thing, to stream uh, live on your on, uh, different platforms. It is available for Windows and for Mac OS 10.13 and above. And it is actively supported. Like I said, it is free and open source. The most uh, recent version is in October. The one caveat about it is it is uh, full featured, which means it has something of a uh, learning curve. And I'm still working on that myself. 
I got it so I can record today, and I'll probably be doing a presentation later when I become a little more uh, familiar with it. But I'll be using that during the Windows portion of the meeting, and I'll bring it up uh, when I switch over at that point and, uh, and show you what it looks like. And it is available at obsproject.com. Again, free and open source, so it does have uh, help materials there uh, for, for dealing with it, learning how to use it. Very. My favorite is, also, is a little bit to do with uh, what we're going to go over later with the operating system upgrades. And I think I may have even shared this as a favorite in a previous meeting some time ago, but I have an app called Mac Updater. It's from Core Code. You can find it at corecode.io. That's the website. And it's a nice little utility to help you keep your software on your Mac up to date. I'll just show you real briefly here what it looks like. There is a free tier. There's some limits in terms of how often and how many apps you can update at a time with the free tier. The paid uh, license is a for life license, and I think it's 20 bucks. So uh, I have to look that up at checkcorecode.io for the pricing and so forth. But uh, here's the interface, and this is showing the results of the last scan I did. Uh, if you pay for it, you can have it run in the background all the time and keep things up to date automatically in the background. I don't have that turned on personally. I just run a scan like once a week or something. I have a kind of a reminder on the weekend to do this uh, with other some other maintenance tasks. But I'm gonna click this uh, corner button in the bottom right to initiate a new scan to see if, oh, I have to give it permission to go to the internet, sorry. <laughs> I have another little utility that limits internet traffic when I'm on a, uh, a network other than my own. Anyway, so it's scanning for, uh, it's comparing my apps on my computer to a database it keeps on the internet on, uh, on corecode.io and then showing me the results. And uh, apparently I still only have two apps right now that uh, need updates. Carbon Copy Cloner, which is a backup app, and Text Expander, which is a utility for uh, expanding snippets into larger, uh, longer uh, text strings. So, uh, the paid version allows you to do the select quick update apps at the bottom. It'll select everything and then you can tell it to update. And everything it'll up, it can update, it'll just do it for you. You don't have to go to the website, you don't have to download a new installer, you don't have to go through all that. You don't have to launch the app. Um, some apps, it'll, uh, it'll only download an installer, but it'll auto-launch that installer for you. Like if, it, if I have to update the Zoom app for the video conferencing online, it downloads an installer, but it launches the installer, and then you can go in. Uh, you just have to manually say, yes, install it, and then it does it. And, uh, but the uh, Mac Updater app does all the heavy lifting for you to get it going. Uh, you can have it uh, look at your entire app library, including apps from the Mac App Store if you want to. Uh, it won't automatically update those, but at least it'll tell you if, there, if there's an app update from the Mac Apps, App Store, and then you can go to the Mac App Store and, and uh, run the updater there. Uh, that's built into the App Store app. Uh, you can have it show all your apps or just only show the apps that uh, need updates. And you can have it hide. I have it set for hiding all the apps that it cannot update. So there are some other options. Um, there's settings. There's even built-in documentation right in the app that you can read to uh, find out how to use it. So it's a nice little utility keeping things up to date, which is one of the things you want to do before you op update your operating system. Corecode.io. You can search for Mac Updater. There is an app or an, a website called Mac Update without the ER on it. Don't get them confused. They're two different things. So Mac Update is a web service that does something similar that allows you to, you know, kind of look through a library, online library of apps that uh, and see if yours need updating. But it's not an app that you download and use on your computer like this one is. So Mac Updater is the one that uh, I'm choosing as my favorite, and you get it at corecode.io. They have some other software uh, titles there as well. Yes, there, uh, I think there's a, a similar product for the Windows platform called My PC, and it will go in and survey all your uh, applications and update them on that. I wouldn't, would not be surprised. 
The uh, comment was that uh, there's a similar software for Windows. Uh, what'd you say it was called again? My PC that will also do an inventory, compare it to a database, and help you up, up, or update your uh, Windows apps. I'd have to look around for that. The only one I knew of was Secunia PSI, and they stopped doing that. Uh, another company acquired them, and they cut off that service a couple years back. That was the only one I was aware of. I'll, I'll take a look at that and see if I can find it. Anybody else have a favorite they'd like to share today? We heard already heard a little bit about John's new computer, <laughs> his new favorite. <laughs> oh yeah. All right. I'm saving mine for uh, January. Or hold, uh, but I can't demonstrate it. It's a problem. Right. Yeah. So, uh, just real quick, I've got one I've been playing with. Uh, it's part of Set App. It's called Bartender. Oh. And it allows you to get control over the menu bar icons. And I'm using it. If you have problem with your menu bar, this is a godsend program. Yeah. So it manages all these little uh, extra icons in, that uh, pop up in your menu bar. For now, do you have? Um, uh, oh, do you use Presentify from Setup? No, I haven't looked at that one. Uh, download it right now and use it. It allows you oh. to annotate the screen oh. easily. All right. Bartender, yes, another good favorite for, for the Mac, if you have a lot of menu bar items. So we are at break time, a little past, but uh, we're getting, we're fairly close to being on time. Take a break. So today's main topic, the next hour and 40 minutes or so, operating system updates. We've had some uh, new operating systems come out this fall, and uh, we're going to try to cover four main things. First, a, just a brief overview about preparing your devices for uh, an update to your operating system. What you need to think about and what you need to do before you actually pull the trigger and do it. And then Mike's going to share about Windows 11, the new version of Windows. Then we'll have another short little break. And then the uh, final segment, uh, I'll talk about iOS 15 for the iPhone and macOS 12 Monterey for your Macintosh computer. What do you need to do to prepare for an operating system update? We got some basic, simple. Number one, you need to determine whether the hardware you're using can actually run the new software. <laughs> We're actually gonna be uh, both telling you specifically how to do that in, the, in our respective segments. But it's important to know that uh, you can actually use it on your computer or mobile device that you're using now if you want to update to the operating system. And then we've talked about it in several sessions over the past several years, backups. You want to back up the internal storage on your device, on your computer, before you apply any major operating system update. Anything else to add to that, Mike? You don't have to necessarily back up your applications, just back up your unique user data, your photographs, your documents, and such. Chances are pretty good that you'll be installing a new up, uh, new operating system uh, from a fresh download or a fresh set of disks, or however, and it's best to uh, reinstall any applications you have uh, from your beginning material, and then just bring back the unique data, the unique information that you have, photographs, documents, that kind of thing. Then, it's a good idea to make sure that all those apps that you're using are up to date, especially uh, in the case of, unlike what Mike just said, if you're, if you're not going to reinstall all the apps from scratch, if you're going to migrate a system into a new operating system, you want to make sure that the apps you're using are also compatible with that new operating system. That's one reason I shared Mac Updater for you Mac users. Um, that's one thing I do before I do any operating system update. Make sure all of the apps on my computer are up to date. Uh, both those from Apple, the App Store, and from other third-party developers. By the way, I have a question. Can anybody tell me, we got first-party apps from the vendor, like from Apple, the apps that come with your operating system, and you got third-party apps that are made by independent developers or other companies that are not Apple. Who's the second party? <laughs> I'm going to make it up and say it is developers that are contracted by the... Oh, I hadn't thought of that. Second party. I th okay, okay. That makes sense. I always wondered that. I learned something new today. <laughs> anyway, 
So, uh, if you're unsure, then it's a good idea to contact the developer directly. So if you have a vital application that you're using to do something and you don't know that it's compatible with the new operating system, go to that developer's website. Uh, most of them have contact uh, forms that you can send a message and if it doesn't say specifically on the website somewhere, this latest version is compatible with the operating system you're planning on installing, contact the developer and ask. So if it's something you rely on, you may have to wait for the developer to update their app before you update your operating system if the old version won't work with the new operating system. And then I always like then to do another backup. <laughs> Make sure everything's backed up once again uh, before getting the new operating system. Is that on a different storage media so you have two good backups? That's a, that's a good point. That could be a, a very uh, good way of approaching it. I often try to have redundant backups anyway, but uh, I always refresh all of them, <laughs> if, uh, all of them that I can. I have, I have often heard horror stories in the corporate world of your system fails, that's all right, we have a backup. And you bring up the backup, and the first thing you see is error message, backup aborted. You thought you had a backup. You thought you had a backup. <laughs> all right. Then, I mean, again, get a little Mac OS uh, specific here, uh, and, and Mike can share how things are work, work on the Windows environment, because even though I use a Windows computer, I don't do anything about updates, except for the Adobe Creative Cloud apps that I happen to use on it. Those I can update myself, but uh, anything operating system level is handled by the IT department. But uh, with a Mac OS, you can get the installer beforehand. You have to get the installer before you actually install a new operating system. And there are a couple of ways you can get that installer. One is at the Mac App Store, and the other is through uh, System Preferences if you happen to be running Mac OS Catalina or newer. That would be Catalina or Big Sur if you're moving to Monterey, the latest. And actually, when you uh, click on that Get button in the Mac App Store for the operating system update, it'll launch System Preferences and go to the Software Update Preference pane and actually then download it uh, there. So before you can install it, it has to download the installer. This installer, by the way, is about 12 gigabytes. So it may take a while. At my internet speeds where I live, it took over 10 hours. I started it when I went to bed and then after breakfast the next day, it was there. <laughs> um, but what will happen is it'll Put a, net, a new application in your applications folder called install Mac OS Monterey in this case or whatever the uh, version is. And it'll auto launch itself to begin the process. But it pauses on a splash screen with a continue button waiting for you as a user to tell it to go ahead and do it. My advice is don't do it at that point. Quit the app. Command Q. We talked about keyboard shortcuts last month. I did mention that. So Command-Q would be your seventh uh, keyboard shortcut that I recommend uh, memorizing for quitting. There's also a quit item in the menu bar, uh, or in the application menu. And once you quit the app, then make a copy of the installer. Connect a uh, removable drive of some kind and drag a copy onto uh, another media so that you have another copy of that installer someplace else than on your main computer in the applications folder. Because once you've installed it, it auto-deletes itself. And if you need that installer again, you won't be able to get it unless you've copied it. How does that compare with Windows when you're first getting, do you have to get an installer for Windows? No, you don't, and I'll be showing you how to do that. Uh, Windows upgrades are straight directly from the operating system from the Windows Update area of settings, and I'll be showing you that here momentarily. Okay, great. Once you've made a copy of the installer, at least in the case of the Mac, I recommend then unplugging your backups. Don't have them connect to your computer when you're installing a new operating system. In fact, I would uh, recommend unplugging all peripherals, except for your keyboard and mouse, if they happen to be wired connections. <laughs> How about your network? Um, well, it, I don't usually turn off the network, do you? I just unplug uh, 
peripherals, specifically uh, storage devices, hard disks and scanners. And Well, a scanner's not a storage device, but anything that connects via USB or Thunderbolt or uh, one of those other things, I unplug. But I do keep connected to the network. Then you can run the installer or do whatever you do on Windows, <laughs> which we'll find out. <laughs> and uh, I do have some... Whoops. <laughs> I have some more, some more specific information about... Uh, this doesn't seem to be consistent. I wonder if the battery's going bad. Or maybe it's the radio. So, um, I have some more information about Monterey specifically, of course, when we get to that, at that point. Once the new operating system's in place, I like to check my system. What about you, Mike? What do you do? Yeah, I do a general run through and make sure all the stuff that I use all the time still works. Oh, too many surprises. Right, exactly. Open some windows, open some apps, read your email, surf the internet a little bit, make sure everything is working and is where you want it to be. Bonnie has a question. So what are you going to do if it That's where you have backups. Repeat the question. What are you going to do if it doesn't work? That's where you have backups. <laughs> uh, as far as Windows goes, Windows is very good uh, on fail setups, on regressing itself and putting back the original operating system. That's gotten very, very good in the last couple of uh, generations. All right. Once everything's working again, it's time to uh, plug your backups back in. And there's a couple of options here. I like to keep uh, the last backup I did of the previous operating system intact for a while. So I'll actually start a new backup with the new operating system anytime I can so that if I, especially if I have, um, have a cloned system where I can just install the old one on top of the new one by erasing the hard drive and putting the old system back in place, I can get back to where I was before I ran the update. Uh, so I'll start a new backup with the new operating system and keep the old one for a while until I make sure that everything is going to go forward as smoothly as possible, and then I'll repurpose that old backup drive in some other redundant backup role. Nothing else there? Okay, and then you're good to go. Start enjoying the new features of your new operating system on your device. Get into the nitty-gritty with Windows 11, the new version. Take it away, Mike. All right, let's get down to it. I just switched out the, the HDMI switch we had. You know we're geeky. Each of us has our own HDMI switch. We both brought them along. Okay, Windows 11 is a more interesting upgrade than previous generations of Windows. I have here, just for comparison purposes, what the upgrade requirements were to go to Windows 10 as opposed to Windows 11. To go to Windows 10, you had to have Windows 7 or 8. You, your processor had to be one gigahertz or faster. You had to have two gigabytes of RAM. Your hard drive had to have 20 gigabytes of available storage space. And just as a matter of note, Windows 10 will be supported until 2025, is the, uh, the current plan. Okay, for Windows 11, the requirements have gotten a bit more uh, strenuous. It requires Windows 10 version 2004 or higher. So, Bonnie, you mentioned that you've got a Windows 8 system. Uh, you would have to upgrade that to Windows 10 first before you can upgrade it to Windows 11. The processor is 1 gigahertz or faster, and it has to be at least a dual-core processor. What that means, a uh, core is a virtual processor, a virtual CPU that's on the chip. So a dual-core means it's actually emulating having two processors on the chip. That is a minimal requirement, and it has to be on a compatible 64-bit processor. So it no longer supports 32-bit hardware. It has to be 64-bit, and it has to be a compatible processor. And I have a link to Microsoft list, Microsoft's list of processors. If you go there, you will see hundreds of processors listed from AMD, AMD Intel, and I believe Ryzen. Uh, what their uh, criteria is for an eligible processor, I have not yet been able to figure out uh, why some are uh, acceptable and others are not. Unfortunately, what this does is it makes most systems that are older than just a couple of years old ineligible for an upgrade. You must have at least four gigabytes of RAM. The hard drive, this is interesting. Instead of saying you had to have this much space available, the way they put it was you have to have at least <clears throat> at least a 64 gigabyte hard drive. So I'm not sure if they have, there was a deliberately change in phrasing uh, or if you just require 64 gigabytes for the install 
uh, are exactly what they meant. Here's where the big changes were. For many, many years, our computers had a BIOS system, basic input output services. Those, that was a software that would boot when you first turned your computer on and would bring everything up. That has been replaced over the last few years by something called UEFI, WIFI, which is United, Ex or United Extensible something, I don't remember the acronym, firmware, yeah, I'm sure firmware is in there somewhere. But that is now a requirement. It will not go on a system that's got BIOS, which is an older system anyway. Uh, and it must be capable of doing what they call secure boot. That is a firmware integrated uh, security system. It also must, rust, must run a trusted platform module chip version 2.0 or later. The reasoning for these is it protects your system much more vigorously against ransomware than older systems. These are firmware level protections that make it very difficult for uh, an intruder to take over your system. You also must have a broadband internet connection for installation, and you must have a Microsoft account. Uh, where for Windows 10 Home, it is not an option to log in with a local account. You have to create a networked Microsoft account. If you have Windows 11 Enterprise, that does allow you to make a local account. Most of us have Windows 10 Home. Question so far. The account is for you to access Microsoft's services and for it to allow you to use any devices that you have, any uh, multiple uh, computers or uh, iPhones or iPads, to actually use them in Microsoft's own microcosm. As an example, and I'll show you this in a little bit, I also subscribe to Microsoft 365, which is their office, and I will admit it, it is handy for me. I have a desktop and I have two laptops. I've signed them all into my Microsoft account and I can very easily work on documents, PowerPoint slides, whatever, going from one system to another. I mean, it is, it is seamless. Very, very much uh, easy to use if you go into that environment. But that's it, basically. Uh, I get, uh, the way to be the cynical person I am is to encourage you to use uh, Microsoft products throughout uh, your environment because they all do work very easily together and, and quite nicely. Other questions? So can you upgrade? The easiest way to determine if your system can do this is to use the PC Health Check app, and I'll be demonstrating this in a moment. That can be found under your settings and update and security. It has a section to tell you if your system is Windows 11 ready. And if not, it offers to download the PC Health Check app. You get the uh, app installer, it's, install it, run it, and it'll let you know if your system is Windows 11 ready or where it is not compatible and what you can do to uh, change that. And it also has some other useful information. So I will demonstrate that in a second. After that, I'm going to talk about uh, various Windows 11 features. I have them spelled out here. I'm probably just going to be running through uh, the taskbar and the settings, and that's going to hit uh, most of these. We'll talk about the basic appearance, taskbar, the start button, which has got quite a change from what we're used to, what they call widgets. Something that Microsoft has done is they have integrated Teams, team, teams Chat into the operating system. This is Microsoft's answer to Zoom, and it does make it much easier uh, to have uh, team projects working on your system. I'm going to talk about Windows settings, and the Microsoft Store, which has been upgraded. And then some other nice things is the Get, it, Get, Get Started and Tips app. It has been upgraded and works very nicely. And a few various things, Notifications and Action Center, Power Motor Networks. The search box has been revamped, as has Cortana, and all of that work does work quite nicely. Uh, File Explorer, Windows and Snap View. I've got one thing there I want to show you. The Command Prompt, it also has an option now called Terminal which brings up a command window. And they've done a much better job of, it, of integrating Windows subsystem for Linux. If you want to use a Linux system, they've made it much easier to run Linux as a part of Windows. You don't have to have a separate virtual window. And under that, you can also run Linux GUI apps. Another thing they put in there is estimated time to update has been improved so that you have a much better idea how long it will actually take you to do a Windows update. And there is a system under personalization for device usage that will set common settings for you. And also, eventually, they were supposed to have this uh, ready, uh, apparently they didn't have it in time for launch, is the ability to run Android apps underneath that Linux subsystem. And Android apps will be available in the Microsoft Store. Currently, that is not the case. That, that should be coming. So let me go ahead and show you the uh, Windows, how you would check for an upgrade. Again, I'm on my Windows 10 box here. Come on, you can do it. Hmm. Maybe it can. Interesting, it doesn't like that when I turn off my PowerPoint slide. Come on, 
You can do it. There we go. All right, this is my Windows 10 box. And by the way, something else I did mention earlier, I am recording using the open broadcast streaming uh, software, and I get kind of a kick out of what it looks like when it's actually capturing the display screen. Right now I have it capturing my microphone and my display screen. I have it minimized if I bring it up. It kind of shows a picture of itself taking a picture of itself taking a picture of itself, etc., etc. I, I never get tired of that. <laughs> All right, so I want to see if I can upgrade this system. Short answer, I can't, which really surprised me. It's not that old. But I go to my start button on the lower left. I go to my settings icon and update and security. And I see I have a big box here that says, this PC does not currently meet the minimum system requirements to run Windows 11. Get the details and see if there are things you can do in the PC Health Check app. And then there's a link here. If you click on this, it will take you to a site for Microsoft to download. And check for compatibility, download the PC Health Check app. I've already done that and I ran it, so I actually installed it on my system. So I'm going to find that now by going to my search box and typing in PC. And that's the first thing that comes up, PC Health Check. So I'm going to run that. And it has a lot of interesting information with it. Uh, it has my computer name. This one's called Excalibur. And how much RAM I've got, how much uh, hard drive I've got. And it mentions that this is three years old. I can also rename my PC from here if I want to. Uh, it knows that I'm signed into the Microsoft account. And it has a few other things here that I can check. So the thing we're interested in right now is introducing Windows 11. I'll click check now. And it says, no, this PC does not meet Windows 11 system requirements. And the reason is the processor isn't currently supported for Windows 11. I have an Intel Core i7, which again surprised me, uh, 7700 HQ CPU at 2.80 gigahertz. It has a link here more about supported PCs. If you go there, it will take you to Microsoft's list of supported PCs. If I click on see all results, it tells me about everything else here. It does run secure boot. It does have TPM 2.0. It's got enough memory. It's got enough hard drive space. It's got enough cores and it's fast enough, but it's not a supported processor. How so, bizarre. How bizarre. Like I said, I have yet to figure out what makes, what is the criteria for being a supported processor or not. Now, I understand that there is a registry hack out there that you can put in a modification into the registry so it won't check for that and it will allow you to uh, install Windows 11. Uh, everything I've read says you can do that. You probably shouldn't for the simple reason it can lead to, as John always put it in our beginning programming classes, unanticipated results. <laughs> no one's tested uh, for those for what happens with that hack, so you don't know what's going to happen. But you could probably get the thing installed. So this system will not run Windows 11. So I'm leaving it at Windows 10, which is cool because I can use that for demonstrations like this. Any questions? All right, we're all good. So in order to play with Windows 11, now I have a reason to upgrade to a new computer. <laughs> Fortunately, I have a very patient wife. This is my Windows 11 system. Carolyn has been using a Microsoft Surface laptop for a few years now, and she really likes it. And I noticed when I was shopping that most of the laptops that are out there, due to supply chain issues, they all have Windows 10 on them. They can be upgraded, or so they say. I wanted to be sure. So I went ahead and I purchased a Microsoft Surface Laptop 4. This is their latest uh, laptop. And yes, I made sure it had splashed all over the page, updatable to Windows 11. It actually did come with Windows 10 uh, originally and I upgraded it as, as soon as I could. In order to upgrade, all you have to do is go to the uh, Windows uh, Update screen that I was just on for the PC Health Check. And if you are eligible for uh, Windows 11, it will have a button there that says, yes, you're eligible, do you want to upgrade now? And if you do, you go ahead and click on that and it will start downloading all the information it needs, you know, all the stuff it needs and it will upgrade. I'm not sure how long exactly it took this to upgrade because I it went into the screen with, this is going to take a while, it's going to reboot a few times, go get a sandwich, enjoy yourself, watch your favorite TV show, Battlestar Galactic is on, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, <laughs> it probably took a couple of hours anyway for it to finish the upgrade when I came back. And when I came back, this is what I had. This is pretty much out of the box, <coughs> um, except for a couple of things I've installed. So this is Windows 11. Unfortunately, you can't see the taskbar. Fortunately, you can see the taskbar. Hmm. Let me see here if what I can do. I'm going to mess with my display settings. Uh, do, 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 do. That didn't do it. Boy, and I cannot do that either. That's the scale of one. Uh, yes, it is. And I have to go larger than the recommended because otherwise I can't see it. This is a very high resolution screen. 
and it is so high resolution, 100%, I can't see anything. This is 175% uh, resolution blown up. And for me, it's actually easier. Here's the resolution, 2496 by 1664. So, what do you think, Barry? What should I try? Hmm. I like the way we did that. Hmm. <laughs> oh, I'm going to see if uh, this will put it on there. I should probably... 1920 by 1200. 1920 by 1200. Yeah, the same. Like, sort of see. That's a lot better. You can sort of see it. I'm going to go down just a little. Uh, Tronic 1440. Oh, no, no. There it is. 1920, 1080. I didn't score it. Uh. Here we go. It's like, it's like it's over scanning. Yeah. Just a little bit. And remember, folks, you're with us as we're doing this live. <laughs> live and unrehearsed. Live and unrehearsed. Can you tell? <laughs> All right. My gosh, this is uh, losing a lot of uh, real estate. Yeah, it did. It? Yeah, it did. All right. First thing I'm going to notice is the, uh, the appearance, which is a little bit cleaner. Something that a lot of people have talked about is it's got more of a translucent look and the windows have rounded corners. I don't know. I don't know why that's such a big deal, but everybody <laughs> makes a big thing about uh, rounded corners. I think with Windows Vista, Microsoft went with the arrow interface, which was translucent and rounded windows, and then they dropped that. I think with Windows Seven or Eight, uh, now the rounded corners are back. Uh, you can go with that. Oh, I, I know there are people will just go nuts if they don't get their rounded corners. Uh, one thing that you don't see as much at this resolution. Probably the biggest thing that got people going is taskbar is now centered instead of being starting at the left. So the start button is over towards the center. And the only option they give you for changing that is you can actually make everything go to the left and that's it. They took away the ability to move the taskbar to the sides or to the top. No one knows why. Yeah, it's, it's very limited. The only thing you could really do is you can move this, this stuff over to the left. And I'll be taking a look at that in a second. And then we still have the system uh, displays over here. So I'm going to go through some of this very quickly. Here is what the start button currently looks like. A lot of people don't like this. What they've done is they've pinned what they consider the most usable uh, used stuff up here. Actually, I fully expect what's going to happen is the more I use this, the things I actually use are going to wind up uh, pinned up here. For example, I've noticed that Word and PowerPoint I've been using quite a bit has moved its way up here. Oh, so they're just dynamically changing. I think it is. I'm not sure. Now, the stuff here at the bottom I've never used. Huh. So I'm curious to see as I use more stuff if this stuff will drop off. Uh, they have that, then they have things that are recommended down here. If I was at a higher resolution, you'd actually see more of this. If you want to see all your apps, then you have more of what you used to have with the, uh, as a list of the entire start menu items. A lot of people aren't crazy about this. There is a company called Stardock that has been making third-party apps for Windows for years, and they have a taskbar modification that will pretty much bring back the old win Windows did. Uh, start box. But well, we don't like change. But we don't like change. No, we don't. <laughs> I go to the recommended. What they call recommended is actually more of frequently used, which I really like. So these are all the documents that I've been working on recently. You'll see all the Windows 11, MVZ, UG meeting stuff, 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 and all of that. Travel journals, because we were just on vacation. So that is essentially what the start menu is here. Search is right here. They basically put search boxes in almost every box you bring up. You can search just about anything. We have the top apps listed here. Quick searches today in history, new movies, translate, markets today. I, when, when I was playing with this, I brought up Windows Terminal. And so that's got an option here. I can look for apps. Again, things I've used recently. Documents, oh, okay, I can search for documents here. I can do a web search here. And here are all the different types of things I could search for. Email, folders, music people, photos, settings, and videos. One thing I'll bring up at this point is Cortana is still with us. It is now, it's not, uh, they're not pushing it as big of a thing as it was. It's more integrated in uh, to the operating system. It's not really its own app anymore, but it is there. And let me see if it'll look, uh, work for me here. Load, oops, load Word. I'll open Word. So it's still there. I have not played with it that much, but it's got possibilities. Over here, we have the virtual desktop. This works a little more smoothly than it did before. The, this capability has been in Windows for a while. They just made it a little more obvious. I can create a second desktop, and now I can actually bring up, for example, I can bring up a Word document here and work on it uh, there. I can bring up a PowerPoint document on this window and just toggle back and forth between them right here. So, for example, on this one, I'll bring up File Explorer. Then I can go back to the first window here. So if you're multitasking, 
uh, it is a way to expand out your desktop without actually having another physical screen. The next thing in the taskbar is what they call widgets. These are the things that used to be with the start menu in Windows 10. The default things we added here is the weather, the photos, and tips. I mentioned that there's a tips app, and I believe that Barry actually talked about that uh, a couple of meetings Windows back. 10. Windows 10, and it's still here. And they have a Windows tip here, uh, Windows tip app here, and it brings it up. You can add widgets. So if I click on that, I can add things about family safety, an Outlook calendar, sports, entertainment, a watch list, a to-do list, traffic, and esports. And I can personalize it with other things as well. And down here I have news, COVID, and a few different news feed items. And I think this just keeps scrolling forever as long as I keep going. Uh, loads another it story. just it just keeps on going. <laughs> All right, the camera app here is for Teams chat. Team chat again, it, much like Zoom. So if uh, Barry and I want to get together sometime, I might do this. I invite them to join me for a chat in real time. Microsoft Edge. And the one thing a lot of people are complaining about is they've made it a lot more difficult to change your defaults for Microsoft Edge. Uh, I've set up Google to be my default browser, and it will be my default browser. But if I want to do my, pretty much anything else. I have to go in and to the settings and individually change each thing to go from Edge to uh, Google. Hmm. Yeah. But the Edge does work pretty well from what I've seen. Uh, not a bad not a bad browser. File Explorer is right here. Looks a lot like the old File Explorer. Uh, I've got a few new, uh, few new things uh, here. If I open this up, then I've got options up here to create new folder shortcuts, all sorts of things in here that I can put into a folder. About everything you can imagine. I can do a sort by all sorts of ways, and I can view, again, by a lot of different ways there. And then I can either pin to quick access, select all, select none, or invert. Properties and options. Ooh, options. And that brings up the old folder options menu, which has not really changed much in many, many years. Microsoft Store. They have revamped this. It looks a lot better than it used to. Top free apps are up here at the top. Essential apps. Then they have a categorized music, movies. Basically, they can sell you just about any multimedia that you can imagine. So is this store uh, specifically a Windows 11 version? If you go to the Microsoft Store on 10, it's still a different, it looks different? Nope, it's pretty much the same. Oh. I was up there and they basically launched the revamp store at the same time they launched Windows 11. But you still get the same experience now. Uh, with any version of Windows, or at least Windows 10. Uh, gaming, they're big into gaming on this one because they've done more integration with Xbox. And you, I understand you can actually do a lot of gaming between the PC and Xbox. You can go back and forth between them on games you've bought on their network. Ooh, Star Trek Timeline. I have to check that one out. Yeah, I think that's available. Uh, I would not, iOS. would not doubt it a bit. Oh, one thing, as long as I have a Windows open, the, this is the Minimize Maximize button. Now if you hover over it, if you have multiple windows open, it gives you the option to tile from here. So instead of dragging windows around, you can tell it, I want to tile in this way, by side by side. I want one full, one partial, uh, side by side with a couple of quadrants or four quadrants. So that's a new little thing they threw in there. Mail is built in here. Uh, I have not set this up. I just use Gmail on the web. But if I wanted to have a client local, I can set it up through here and use uh, Microsoft's mail. Different than Outlook. This is different from Outlook. Uh, this is just a, a front end to your email client. Here is something I'm going to mention that is not does not come with Windows 11. I actually downloaded this myself. As I said, I've got my these two laptops and my desktop system at home, and I've gone ahead and logged into all three of them with my Microsoft account. I also subscribe to Office 365, so I've logged into all three of those. And this is the Office app that is downloadable from the Microsoft Store. And I've downloaded it on all three because then it's just very easy uh, for all my productivity needs. I have all my recent stuff, everything I've worked on, and half of this I worked on on my desktop, half of it I worked on on one of these laptops. I've got a centralized area for dealing with all of them. Plus, I can get to all my Word applications from here. So to me, this is one of the more compelling reasons for uh, doing a Microsoft subscription. Uh, that and the fact that I don't have to worry about updating them. I know they're always going to be updated. I thought this was, was pretty handy. And then, of course, the Google and the Chrome that I'm running here. I'm quickly running out of time, so I'm going to bring up one other thing. And this is the thing, if you upgrade, you're going to want to explore, is the settings. If I right-click on the Start menu, it brings up a lot of different options, apps and features, a mobility center, power options, just about everything you can imagine to include settings. Settings is where they really changed a lot of things. And I could easily spend an entire class or an entire time just going through this. At the top of it is the system. Uh, I named this one the Defiant. And you're seeing a, uh, a theme on that. This is the Defiant. 
This is the Excalibur at my desktop at home and it is Enterprise. <laughs> Microsoft 365, I'm using OneDrive because I get one terabyte of, in, of storage on my OneDrive with the uh, subscription. So things are being backed up to the OneDrive. Windows update was checked recently. And here's where I can do all the display, sound, notifications, about everything you can imagine. I was going to go through a lot of this. I don't have time now, it looks like. Uh, and again, you can see they put a lot more detail into this than they had before. That's the system. You've got areas for Bluetooth, for using Bluetooth and devices. So you can easily attach things using Bluetooth to this laptop. Here's the network and internet. It knows I'm connected to college user on a five gigahertz network. Uh, it knows how much uh, data usage I've used in the last uh, couple of days, last, night, last 30 days. Well, I've had it about two weeks now, actually. So all the good things there for uh, connecting to the internet. Personalization is one you'd probably want to spend a lot of time on. I've got this set right now to the default Windows 11 uh, background. I thought that was appropriate. I'll be changing it around uh, when I get home. <laughs> background, colors, themes. You know, I've got uh, the digital blasphemy uh, backgrounds I like to use. I can modify my start menu here. Show recently added apps, show most used apps. Folders. Oh, one thing I wanted to do while I was thinking about it. Okay, here are the folders that I can actually have to show up next to the power button if I so desire. Apps and features, so I can uh, install and uninstall apps from here. My account management, and this is where you'd go if you want to actually create another account for someone on, uh, on the same system. Sign-in options, uh, this particular laptop, my Windows 10 uses uh, thumbprint identification, fingerprint identification for login. This one uses uh, face recognition, which I find works very well, by the way. Windows Backup, which I have not had a chance to use yet, and Access Worker School. Oh, going back to personalization for a second, one thing I wanted to point out was device usage. This is, how do you use your system? If you do gaming, then it will turn this on. Then you'll get personalized tips, ads, and recommendations about using it in that fashion. So they have uh, categories for gaming, family, creativity, school, entertainment, business, and then information about your privacy. Going back down here, time and language, your date, time for your clock settings, language and region, typing and speech. Like I said, they've integrated a lot of stuff with uh, Xbox. And finally, accessibility, which I found to be very useful for uh, making it a little more usable. Like I said, out of the box with this particular system, the resolution is so high, uh, I had a very difficult time uh, actually reading <clears throat> reading much of anything on it. I also find I like to make the mouse pointer a little bit bigger uh, than what the default is. So a lot of good things here uh, for hearing as well, as well as speech interaction. And eye control, this is new. An eye tracker for Texas. All right, that is as far as I'm going to take it today. Like I said, I could spend an entire morning going through this, obviously. This is a high, uh, high look. Now, do you need to upgrade to this? Is it a crucial upgrade? I would say no. It has a lot of nice features. It works, seems to work pretty well. Uh, if you're using Windows 10 and you're happy with it, there's really no compelling reason, I think, to change at this point. There's no killer app here that I can see. But it is, I think, a lot easier to use in many ways and, for me, a lot of fun to play with. Questions? Yeah, Bonnie. So, if you buy a Windows 10 that's mm -hmm. Windows 11 ready, you said that you would immediately upgrade to Windows. I mean, if you had a, a laptop like that, a system like that, you would immediately upgrade to Windows 11. Why would you immediately do that? You don't have to. You can if you wanted to. Because what you'll do is you'll go up to the update settings and you'll see an uh, a box there that says you can upgrade to Windows 11. You don't have to. You don't have to press that button right then. Um, I did it because I knew I was going to need to familiarize myself with this presentation. Uh, but you can take your time. Matter of fact, uh, you may not even see it unless you go looking for it. They're doing the rollout slowly. Uh, probably it's going to be offered more to the newer computers that can handle it more. But they're saying the rollout's going to happen throughout uh, 2022. Yes, ma'am. You have until 2025. Yeah. If you want, want 11 and you, you may want to do it right away, do it before you even put any of your other apps on your things that you already know that it's going to work once you put the apps on. If you put it on but you get a whole bunch of apps on it and then you try to do it, some of the apps may not like may not play. So if you do it before, you know, brand new computer, but it came with 10, you want 11, put it on, then you don't have to, once you put your apps on, then they're going to be seeing the 11, not the 10. That it is a lot easier to upgrade a clean computer than when, when you've already put your uh, applications on. Um, I have yet, I have not yet come across anything that, uh, any application that this breaks. Not that I put that many on here at, uh, yet, but everything seems to work uh, pretty well with it. Other questions? 
Ted will no longer be supported in 2025. It will still work. And the way that Microsoft seems to work is they're saying that it won't be supported. Well, I have a feeling they're going to be supporting it beyond that for the simple reason. The last uh, polls I saw, something like 70 or 75 percent of business corporations won't be able to run Windows 11. And uh, I know, I know hardware first. Right? Yeah, they got to buy new hardware. And I know how corporations are uh, with their upgrade plans. So I know this has happened in, in past versions of Windows where they've supported it uh, past what they said they would uh, due to circumstances. Even Windows 7, they'll still come up with a Windows 7 security update occasionally and push it out just because it's a crucial thing. Yes, Carolyn? If it's not, they don't support it, does that mean Windows 7 won't work anymore? I don't know. <laughs> I don't, I think it would. Because again, I think that they're uh, not going to alienate customers in that fashion. But uh, when they say it won't be supported, it just means they won't offer updates anymore. It doesn't mean it won't, uh, it'll stop working. It'll keep going. Uh, I know there's still, that's one of their uh, issues, is they still have a lot of people with Windows 7 out there. That's why they occasionally issue those uh, critical Windows 7 security updates when they know that if they don't fix them, it's going to break the entire ecosystem. Other questions? All right, with that, I am going to turn it back to Barry. Okay, thanks, Mike. And it's time for another break. Oh. First off, as we mentioned in our overview, what hardware can run? this operating system. An iPhone 10 and newer, if you have a Face ID version of an iPhone, started with the iPhone 10, so you got the 10, 10S, 10R, 11, 12, and now the 13s, you can run iOS 15. iPhone SEs, both the first and the second generation, can run iOS 15. An iPhone 6S, these are iPhones with Touch ID, 6S through the iPhone 8 Plus. So the 6S, 6S Plus, 7, 7 Plus, 8, and 8 Plus can all run iOS 15. And if you have an iPod Touch, if it is the latest generation, the seventh generation iPod Touch, you can also run iOS 15 on it. And earlier iPod Touches will not be able to upgrade to the iOS 15. Some of the new features are hardware dependent. So there are some things in the new operating system you won't have available on older hardware. But in general, all these iPhones can run that uh, the new, new release. It was publicly released in September, September 20th, last, well, this is November, two months ago almost now. And it's been through some updates already. The current version is 15.1. So we went through the 15.0.1, was there a point two? I can't remember, there may have been. So the initial, uh, you know, bug squashing releases that are inevitable after a new operating system comes out have, have been taken care of and we're actually into 15.1, which activated some of the new features that weren't uh, available at release. <clears throat> Here's one of the changes that's happened with operating systems for iPhones going from 14 to 15. You have to actually choose to do it. Even if you have uh, in this... Uh, system update, software update part of settings, if you have it, have it turned on for your iPhone to automatically update, it won't automatically go from 14 to 15. Apple will still be supporting 14 and th probably 13, maybe even some uh, security updates for 12. Uh, and you can stay on 14 as long as you want. If you want to upgrade to 15, if you haven't already, in the software update uh, settings, there's a button to where you choose to tell it to, tell the uh, phone to go ahead and do it, and then it'll download and install it. It won't automatically move you from 14 to 15 like in the past that it would have. Hey, Barry, go through the, because right now I'm still on 14. So if I want 15, what do you what do you do? Okay, I'll show you. Well, I'll show you where you where you can go, but you won't see it on the screen. But I'll show you where to go because I've already updated my phone. So you go into the settings app and you go to general and then software update and it'll tell you that what operating system. Now I'm not connected to the internet with my phone so that's why you see this. If it says that you have 14 whatever and you're up to date with 14, there'll be a button at the bottom of the screen. Is there, a, is there an update to 15 on there? Oh, oh, tap on the automatic updates option then at the top. Okay. Yeah, it's not going to automatically move you to four, from 14 to 15. That's what I just said. <laughs> it's not, you, have to you have to tell the phone to do it. <laughs> 
Okay. I remember Red ever even telling me it was available. Me either. It won't. Oh. You have to go into software update and look. Okay. Now, got to go back to the stop mirroring. Here we go. Get this to work. So, if you want a complete overview, or if you want an overview of uh, what I'm going to talk about today from Apple's point of view, there's a URL there. Apple.com iOS slash iOS dash 15 hyphen 15. And they also have a page for the complete list of features, and that's just text. There's no graphics or photos or anything. But see the data on what the new features are. Add slash features to the end of that URL. I'm just going to go over some highlights. I'm not going to go over the complete list. <laughs> it's long. <laughs> so, and even even at that, the highlights are is, is quite a bit. So I'm going to kind of go app app by app and sh and just mention what they've added and what it might mean. Uh, we're not going to have time to demo everything. I might have to pick out a few things to show you. In FaceTime, they've added a feature called SharePlay, and this allows you to watch and listen to content with whoever you are FaceTiming with. So if you have a FaceTime video conference going with someone and you both decide you want to listen to a song in Apple Music, then you can start a song, one of you can start a song, and it'll be synchronized across both ends and you can hear the same thing at the same time. Same thing with the video. If you say, oh, let's have a FaceTime call and let's watch the latest episode of Foundation, science fiction drama that's on Apple TV+. Plus. You can start watching that video one, on one end of it and it'll be synchronized across both both ends of the conversation and you can talk on the FaceTime call while the video is going theoretically <laughs> of course some of this depends on your internet connection and speed too so <laughs> there are other <laughs> factors at play anyway that's a new feature in FaceTime uh, spatial audio which may not affect too many people because you have to have a supported audio device and Apple has two right now that support spatial audio that's the AirPods Pro and the AirPods Mac. I believe there's also a couple of the Beats line of uh, headphones earbud things that also support spatial audio. Of course Apple owns Beats but they sell them under the Beats brand still. What spatial audio is it it's supposed to create an, an audio environment that you're basically virtually in. So even though you have you have, you know, listening devices in or on your ears, you turn on spatial audio and you're looking at something on your screen, your video or whatever, and obviously the sound uh, feels like it's coming from that source. But when you turn your head, normally it feels like the source turns with you. And even though if you're watching video and the video is on your side, you're still hearing it as if you're looking at the source this way. Well, spatial audio keeps the audio synchronized with wherever the source is. So you turn your head and the audio in your ears comes from the side. And if it's, you know, full-blown like a theater audio experience, it's a surrounding kind of thing and so it gives you an audio space to listen to things and the audio that's part of the, a video that is uh, spatially around you or it feels that way even though you're listening directly into your ears. So it's all computationally changing how you're listening to it depending on how you move your head and, and how that differs from the source. A lot of these features uh, are kind of, I think, Apple's pandemic response and are kind of catching up with some of the other uh, video conferencing tools out there. FaceTime introduced group FaceTime, was it last year or maybe two years ago now? I can't remember when it first. It's been around a little bit, but what, what you were presented with, if you had more than one person on a FaceTime call, you had these floating uh, boxes of the different people that are involved. And so whoever's talking would come and be enlarged right in front of you and then the other people would get smaller and in the background and then when somebody else starts talking that person would come up and the other and they would just kind of and, and some people complained it was kind of disoriented disorienting anyway 
they've added grid view. So those of you that participated in our Zoom sessions, uh, you know, several months ago, it'll be more like that. You can ha have FaceTime just be a grid of boxes, like on Hollywood Squares, <laughs> so that everybody on the call uh, it has its own has their own space, and they'll just be highlighted if they're the ones that's talking, and they won't get bigger and smaller and move around on the screen. Uh, if you have uh, an iOS device that has a FaceTime. Uh, not FaceTime. It has a um, <laughs> Face ID system that has the uh, you know the the depth sensing sensors for the selfie camera. You can use portrait mode in FaceTime on your phone. Portrait mode when you're taking photographs with the camera. It'll it'll sense the depth and it'll blur the background so that you're sharply focused and everything else is blurry. And Zoom has that function too. We've seen that in the past on Zoom calls as well. So portrait mode on FaceTime. They also have uh, a couple of new microphone modes. Uh, you've got the regular sound input that we've always had, but they've added two uh, other modes on either side of that basically. They have an isolation mode that you can turn on, which will focus on your voice and quiet everything else in your environment. And then they have one atmospheric mode where it will listen to everything around you and include that as well in your audio that you're sending on your FaceTime call. Include all the racket from the dining room while you're talking on the FaceTime call if you'd like to do that. <laughs> if there's something going on around you that you want to have part of the environment, part of the experience. FaceTime now can generate links for scheduled you can make calendar events with these links and send them invites to people. Just like when you, uh, you can create a Zoom link, you can now create a FaceTime link and send it to somebody. And then they, all they have to do is click on it to join your FaceTime call. Of course, it's easy enough to answer a phone if it's just, you know, you're FaceTiming with one other person. But if you have a group meeting that you want to have scheduled, you can do that and send everybody a link. And as part of that, you can now invite anybody. There's a web interface for FaceTime. You can send links to people that have Windows computers or Android phones, and they can participate in a FaceTime call via a web browser. So it's no longer restricted people with Apple. FaceTime can work across the web with, so those are the brief new things in FaceTime for iOS. Messages. Has a, uh, has a new feature called Shared With You. So you can see what other people have shared with you in the appropriate apps where those shares have come from. And they're, they're restricted to a, like a handful at this point. So if someone sends a, uh, a web link to you in a message, if you open your web browser, specifically Safari, it'll show you the things that people have shared with you from Safari. If you someone sends you a link from an Apple News story if they, in the Apple News app, uh, you can see what those, thing, what those people have shared with you in Apple News. Photos is probably the bigger thing. Someone has shared a photo with you in Messages, and in the Photos app, there's now a shared with you item under the For You tab where you can see all the photos that people have shared with you in the in messages. And there's a few other apps like that too. It's it's I don't know, I kind of wish they had done it by person. So I want to go to somebody some contact and see all the things that this person has shared with me rather than what's been shared with me in a specific app or have the option to do either one. That would be that would be cool. Who did that? It, but in the Messages app. Yes. Uh, so in the Messages app, you can look at a contact that you communicate with but and see what they've shared with you. There are new Memoji options. There's some clothing options. You can There are some new poses, and you can customize those for your own Memoji, you know, different kinds of clothes, different kinds of hats and other things. You can create, uh, you know, more Memojis and, of course, use them. And a Memoji, for those that don't know, is like uh, an avatar. It's a cartoony like avatar for yourself that you can create in the Messages app. And photo collections. Now, rack my, rack my memory here. Photo collections. What is photo collections? <laughs> I forgot what photo collections were. Uh, uh, ba -da -ba -da -ba 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 -ba. Oh, 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 in messages, you, you can see all the photos that 
in one place that you, that have been shared with you in mess. So it collects them all in in in, in a in a group, and they they're kind of, they, they can be kind of stacked up in the interface, and then you can click on it to unstack it. Focus a new way of <laughs> dealing with do not disturb. In fact, do not disturb. It's been around for a while. Uh, has been sort of demoted, and is now part of the focus feature. It's like do not disturb on steroids. You can match your device state to your mindset or activity. You can set focus modes up for different things that you're doing like uh, or gaming, driving, or sleeping. In fact, if you've MVCUG ever... <laughs> oh, MVCUG meeting. In fact, I was going to do a demo of that. If you um, have been using do not disturb while driving the feature that was introduced, uh, I think in maybe 13, but at least I know it was in 14. I can't remember how long I've been using it now. If you have set up Do Not Disturb While Driving in a previous version of iOS, when you upgrade to iOS 15, there'll be a driving focus automatically set up for you. You don't have to even create it on your own. It'll be there. Uh, I also do sleep tracking with the bedtime sleep uh, function in the alarm app and also use my uh, watch for part of that tracking. And there was automatically a sleep mode, focus mode, when I upgraded to iOS 15 because I'd been using that feature in, I, in earlier versions. Uh, I set up one for work. Uh, so when I go to my job, it knows where I am and it automatically kicks in and sets up the restrictions that I put in place. Focus allows you to restrict who and what apps are allowed to to disturb you during that time when that particular focus is on. So when I go to work, for instance, I get to City Hall, I can activate it by location. So it knows where I am from GPS and it turns on my work focus and I have my, my, uh, my teammates, anybody from work that I work with closely, are allowed to call or notify me, although they very rarely use my personal phone to do that, but <laughs> they would be, and I also allow my wife in. I put my wife in every focus mode just in case. I want to know if she needs to get a hold of me. She gets a free pass through into every focus. So, and I also, you can restrict it by apps. So certain apps that send you notifications, you can say, okay, I don't want to hear from that app during this time when I have this focus mode on. So I have, like if I have uh, the news app, it gives me notifications. I don't want to see the news while I'm working. If I want to see the news, I'm on a break. I can go and find the news if I want to look at some news, but I don't want it sending me a notification while I'm working. So those notifications will be turned off. Um, during that, while that focus is active. And then when I leave my workplace, that focus turns itself off. And because I drive to work, driving comes on. <laughs> but then when I get home, that turns off, and then, I'm, then, I, then everything comes in, because I haven't set a focus to restrict anything from when I'm just at home doing nothing. <laughs> The other thing about Focus then is also syncs across all your devices. So anything with the same Apple ID that's running iOS 15, iPad OS 15, or Monterey on the Mac, you create a Focus on one, it'll be available on the other. And when, it, when the Focus is activated on one, the activation will go on on the other devices as well. You can also have it signal your status. So if someone does send you a message and they're not being allowed through that focus mode, you can have it send a mess, an automatic message back to them saying, I'm uh, not, uh, or I'm not being allowed, to, or I'm allowing you to disturb, I forgot what it says now. Anyway, it's, it basically lets them know that you're, you'll get the message, but you're, you're busy right now and you'll, you'll get back to them later or whatever. I'm not sure you can customize those. You can customize the do not disturb while driving message, but I don't know if you can customize. I haven't turned on any signals myself yet. It's all fairly new to me, even though I've had it for, on my phone for a few weeks. But notifications. There's uh, just a redesign look of notifications on your screen. It includes contact photos. If someone sends you a message and the notification comes up for that message on your screen, screen of your phone and you have a photo of that person assigned to that contact in your contacts app, that photo will be included in the notification. It will also show larger icons for other notifications so you know where uh, easier can see where those notifications come from, what apps are sending them to you. You can also turn on a notification summary so that if 
a notification comes in and it's not time sensitive, like a calendar event or an alarm or a reminder that you want to get at a specific date and time, if it's not one of those, you can have it delayed and like at a certain time, like maybe once a day, you say, okay, I'm relaxed now, it's after dinner, I can uh, set this to come on at 7 p.m. in the evening, and it'll just send, it'll bring up a summary of all the notifications throughout that entire day that were not time sensitive. And then you can just go through and deal with them at that point, instead of having them just come in willy-nilly all through the day. There's some new features in Maps. There's an all-new city experience in some cities. <laughs> <laughs> I think San Francisco, New York, Chicago, Washington, D.C., Los Angeles, maybe Austin, but I can't remember. Right. Houston. I think it might be Houston. I think there's one in Texas. Anyway, and they're, and they're building this out. But uh, you can see more of a 3D representation of the landscape and the buildings and so forth on the map. Um, there's new driving features. If you're using uh, directions and when you're driving, you can now see turn lanes and crosswalks, bike lanes, there's street level perspectives, and a, a new dedicated driving map. John? There's a beach super critical. Oh, cool. Yeah, no longer do you have to hunt for it. Like if you need to increase the volume. Right. Huh. I haven't used the new driving uh, directions yet. So, so uh, uh, audio access directly on the map yes. for uh, adjusting the audio of the direction voice. Update is phenomenal. I'll have to turn it on to get on my way home. <laughs> There's new immersive walking directions. You can hold your phone up to have it look at the environment you're in. This again is also, I think, limited to certain locations. But if you're in one of these locations, it will it will recognize the cityscape or the street that you're on, and then it'll give you augmented reality directions on your screen where you where you want to walk, and it'll give you information about landmarks or restaurants or whatever on your phone as you're walking by them and getting where you're going. Right now, that's right. It's very clumsy. <laughs> yeah, I imagine. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it, it looks like for, Apple glasses. Yeah, it's a first step towards something you're actually going to be wearing. It'll, it'll display it in front of your eyes without you having to hold up your phone. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's very obvious. No, it's just live. It's just, it's just live uh, data. Yeah, it's unknown whether or not uh, if... If when Apple announces and it comes out with a, an eyepiece augmented reality kind of glasses thing, if it will have a camera that actually takes video. My guess is it won't. Google. Yeah. That more than the four photos. Yeah. I bet it'll be limited to like a LiDAR sensor or something. So it'll, it'll see depth and it'll be able to recognize objects, but it won't actually be capturing any uh, data, any video or uh audio data that way. There's also some new transit features, uh, one of which is it'll, uh, you know, you can program in a, you know, a route and you can, you know, use driving instructions, walking instructions, and now transit instructions, and it will notify you of upcoming stops along the way and and uh, make sure that you don't miss uh, where you need to get off the bus or the train. <laughs> okay, Safari had some big changes. They uh, moved the uh, address and tab, well they added tabs, uh, to the bottom of the screen. And they, it, as part of that they moved the address field to the bottom of the screen. And part of that is so that because the phones are so big now, uh, it makes it easier to navigate in the web browser with a single hand and your thumb or something rather than having to have two hands if you wanted to change what you were looking at and so forth. So they moved things to the bottom and added a new feature called tab groups. This is kind of a new way of thinking about what we used to call bookmarks or favorites in a way. Uh, apparently, the user data uh, has told Apple that people aren't really using bookmarks <laughs> that much anymore. <laughs> they just happen to have a whole bunch of tabs open or a whole bunch of web pages open all at the same time. And so they're just switching between them. But now you can group those into categories if you'd like to and have them, uh, you know, more easily organized. And you can open them all as a group if you want to. And, and uh, 
have you played with those yet? Just started on the phone. There's one big drawback. It replaces what was ever there before that. Oh, but you can add any open tab to any yes. tab group that you have. It, it, as far as that. Yeah. The group right. If you, up, it'll lo all you'll lose all the yeah. That is, yeah, I'll have to watch out for that. You can also now easily access voice search. So right in the address field or the search field, there's a microphone. You don't have to bring up a keyboard to find the microphone anymore. You can just tap the microphone and start talking your search. And iOS or Safari on iOS now also supports extension. If you don't know what an extension is, it's uh, some extra little code that you can add functionality to your web browser. You know, common things are like password manager or um, coupon, you know, coupon, what do you call it? Coupon lookup, <laughs> I guess. There's a number of them out there uh, where, you know, you, it'll, it'll tell you if you're shopping and then this, this little extension will say, hey, I've found 40 coupons you can try on this site to give you a discount. You know, and it'll automatically go through all of them and see if you can get a, get a thing. Anyway. Okay. I'm not visualizing exactly what. Yeah, keychain. Oh, right, yes. That's true. Okay, yeah. iCloud keychain for if you're uh, keep using that for keeping track of your passwords and uh, does credit cards and stuff too now. And, and I think one time two factor authentication codes yes. has been added to that in iOS 15. That's not even part of what we what I had in here. But uh, yeah, that you can access and manage that in in system settings now. Right. It used to be hard to hard to figure out, but they they made it easier to get to. Uh, new features in the wallet. It supports ID cards now. So driver's licenses or state IDs, college or university IDs can be added. However, even though the feature is there, it has to be implemented by a third party. So far it's not well, I think there is, I think I heard of there's a college or a university someplace that's using it already. No someplace. Provision. Well, the college has to have, a, have an app to do that. Oh. Just like, just like, um, like when you add uh, a pass or a, or a, um, you know, uh, a boarding pass, like f use, use, use the airline's app and then you can say add it to wallet. Okay. So the, the, the ID issuer has to have an app and the function then to hook into Apple's API to send it to the wallet. So Arizona, by the way, I mean, they have their own uh, ID app that you can set up and have a virtual driver's license. It's now legal to have a virtual digital driver's license on your phone, and they are in line to be able uh, to put it, the act, uh, the capability to put it into the Apple wallet, but right now it's just in, in its own app. Oh, by the way, on the Arizona Digital, Circle K does not recognize it as being a valid ID. Uh -huh. Do they have a, they don't have a QR code reader for that or something? <laughs> they, they will not accept it. They will not accept it at all. Even though it's got, they, they can read it, they'll take your driver's license and read the QR code, they will not use the digital. Huh. They, they won't even try it. Interesting. Yeah, I know, I've already, Filed a complaint with that one. Okay, if a cop stops you and you have your a cell phone with you and he asks, "Where's your driver's license?" and your battery went dead, and you, is the insinuation that you didn't carry your uh, well, or the license with you? Probably right? always want to have your physical one with you anyway. <laughs> so I, I, can, I can answer that. <laughs> you will be cited for driving without a driver's license. You go to court and show the judge that it's on your phone. And it's dropped. <laughs> I researched that one. Okay. <laughs> Very. Yeah, Tony. I'm not sure. I went down to the drivers to get mine updated, but I couldn't stay any longer. If I see that ID with that star on there, that's going to be put on your driver's license. And if you don't have that on there, you may not be able to stick that on your phone to do it. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. But well, I, know it, I know there's a fee for those updates to do that. Well, right now you can't do it at all. It all depends on the state of Arizona. They have to implement it. And they'll have to implement it in, in the Arizona ID app, which yeah, they you really can get right now for and it's free. And you can put your driver's license in that app, but it won't transfer it to your Apple wallet app at this point. But I think what you're talking about, that star has to be on your driver's license. If it ain't on there, you won't 
be able to do it. That's on if you want to try fly. Okay. That's oh, that's the, oh yeah, the, the enhanced uh, oh, yeah. that ID shows, thing. It, is that what, yeah. what, the, what the digital looks like, it, it, it is your driver's license. Yeah, yeah. you take a Car. picture of it. Okay, because what it does is you go in and you register, it goes up to DMV and downloads a copy of your driver's license. So if it's got the star on it, it'll be on it because it is your driver's license. Right. No, the MVD ID? Yes. Mm -hmm. No, because I tried to use it and it required me to take a picture of the driver's license front and back. And what it does is it goes up and verifies it with the DMV that's the same guard. Right. And then I couldn't use it because then it wanted me to take a selfie and I could not take a selfie to satisfy it on my phone. Really? I, yeah. I went, had no trouble at all. You no, know, with my 6S Plus, I couldn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> your six Maybe it has something to do with your face? No, I'm it just might. Kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> no! <laughs> I was going to say that. Also in the uh, wallet app uh, is the ability to have keys. So if you have a uh, like a smart lock on your house that supports this, you can have a, a key to unlock your house, uh, your garage door. Some hotels are, are, ro are rolling this out for hotel room doors. Uh, workplaces like for uh, you know a key card ID that you have to f swipe someplace to get into a workplace. Uh, that's now possible in Apple Wallet and some automobiles as well. Right now I think only BMW is doing it with one model of, a, of their car but I think Apple flashed a screen at the presentation and had a whole bunch of different car manufacturers who are planning on adding this ability to their vehicles like I think VW and Ford were up there I can't remember all of them but some new cars coming down the road you'll be able to actually open with your iPhone should you care to. Barry? I, Disney World has implemented that already. Oh, Disney World. To get yes, Disney. for getting into the park, for hotel rooms, and it works like a champ. That's good. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, you go up, if you, if you want to get in your room, you just hold your phone up. I actually just hold your phone, and it unlocks the door. Yeah, Marriott yeah. does that with some places. Yeah. yeah. I'm taking a trip in December. As I said, my dad's 90th birthday and we're going back to Missouri again. I'm going to check at the, all the hotels I go to see if they have that ability when I check in. It's <laughs> fine. What, Tony? Don't, don't, don't lose your phone. Don't lose your phone. Don't, yeah. <laughs> Good thing there's a way to find it. But All right, well, we're getting close to the hour. I'm going to, I'm going to sh talk about this probably last. We'll just cut it off here. We're not going to get everything. It's too much. Um, and then I'll do a I'll do a quick demo because I think I think this feature is so cool. Live text, and this has been around in some form or variation for a while, but now it's baked in the operating system on on the iPhone. It reads and converts text that you see in images, and it works on photos that you've already taken. Even if you didn't have iOS 15 before, it'll go. It'll look at old photos and do this. You can just point your camera at something that has text and it'll read the text. Converts it into text that you can actually select and copy and paste someplace else if you want to or act on. It works in Safari. Bring up a Safari uh, page in a web browser and if there's an image with text on it, it'll read it for you and you can actually copy it or do something with it. It'll also do live text translations to other languages or from other languages into English, even if it's an image. If it sees a phone number, you can tap on the phone number that's in the photo and you can have the phone actually call the number. So let's take a look at it real quick before we say goodbye for the day. We'll shut that down and we'll go back to showing my phone here. Oh, I hit the wrong button. So I'm going to go into my photos app here and just open up. Here's a here's an image. Oh, that's interesting. It's it's not showing you my actual interface. That's bizarre. There's a there's a, a limitation to this streaming. Let's see if it'll do. Okay, that's that's a screenshot but it's still only showing you the screenshot oh it's not showing you what I'm seeing on the screen no it's just showing the image it's not showing the interface so I can't I can't point out the button you tap on <laughs> Arg. Um, I can get around it but that means that's a little bit of falderall okay well <laughs> might be be to continue do you remember on the slide the, the icon that I had next to the feature, 
It was a gray circle and it had a little uh, kind of four corners with some lines in it. Well, on my screen, when I'm looking at this photo, I see one of those. And if I tap on it, it still doesn't show you what I'm seeing. Oh, okay. Well, bummer. That's, uh, yeah, maybe I can just go to I can just go to my camera app here. Let's just try that. I'm looking at this paper here, and you see the little live text button at the bottom right of the. Uh, and if I tap that, I can swipe across some text. And this is just looking at a piece of paper, and I can select select all the text on the page, and I can copy it if I want. Let's say I go into notes. We'll just uh, create a new note here and paste it. So there's all the text that I just looked at on this piece of paper. Just pointed my camera at it. <laughs> well, follow my instructions, okay? Oh, yeah. In return, this is, this is the boy. Select the live text. Now point it at, at, the, at the text. The paper. I'll get it. I'll get a fresh sheet. It reads it as you're doing it. It just brought it in. Yeah. So it's it's creating optical character recognition from an image immediately, putting it right into whatever you're typing here. You don't even have to type it or copy and paste it now. <laughs> you can just do it right into a note. With the camera, take my word for it, it does it in photos even though <laughs> it wouldn't show it up here. <laughs> I was going to do a translation, but uh, see if I can find... Oh, I'm not on the internet. I can't I don't have internet access. So we're, since we're out of time, we'll have to, we'll have to move on. But uh, it, it tra yeah, I tried it at home. I opened up... I just searched for... Uh, uh, a, a Spanish signage in an image search on the web and it came up with a bunch of images of signs in Spanish so I just opened up one of those images to, to view the actual image in a web page and Safari automatically sensed the text I tapped on it and it translated it into English English that's another one called Quiz Q-U-I-Z-L-E-T we'll do the same thing so if you're reading Spanish Point your camera to it, it will automatically translate it oh, into English. Oh, Q-U-I-Z-L-E-T. Q-U-I-Z-L-E-T? Yeah, Quizlet. Quizlet, and that's an app. Yes. Basically for translating. Is it just Spanish or does it do? We've run out of time. We didn't get to Monterey. I do want to give you a couple of caveats on Monterey. If you're thinking about Monterey, haven't done it yet, uh, go to apple.com and check out the hardware compatibility list. But here's some warnings for you. Despite whatever time it takes, in addition to whatever time it takes to download the installer, like I said, it took me 10 hours with my very bad internet connection out in Palominas. But once you have it and you start the installer, times vary. On my two Macs at home, it only took a couple hours each at the most. John had his it took, what, six hours? It's, hurt. it's taken as long as eight hours sometimes to install it, depending on how old your Mac is. So give it time. Don't get too impatient. Uh, there's also some anecdotal reports of some problems after installation. Specifically on Intel Macs, there's been reports of them being bricked, which means they're, they just stop working completely. And there's no way to recover it without going to the Apple Store getting help. <laughs> Um, also, there's been some USB and Bluetooth connect connectivity issues. I've had some Bluetooth performance problem on my Mac Mini, my M1 Mac Mini at home. Um, the mouse that I'm using, it's an older mouse. It's an Apple mouse, but it is older, and uh, it's like kind of laggy and delayed. So when I move the mouse, the cursor doesn't do anything, and then it'll jump, um, and it comes and goes. Uh, there's also been some reports of problems with USB connectivity, specifically if you're using a hub and you have external hard drives plugged into the hub that's plugged into your Mac, Monterey may not see them. Uh, just some caveats, some things to think about. Aside from the uh, lagging mouse, and I have tried different mice and this newer mouse works fine. So it's something to do with that other mouse that, I was, that I'm using. I may have to buy a new mouse. <laughs> Did you try resetting the... Well, I didn't yet, but... Um, That's all. Yeah, but it's now a terminal command. It's no longer in the menu in 15 point... In 12.0.1. Really? In, on Monterey, yeah. Uh, they took... You know, you used to be able to hold down a co keyboard combination and click the uh, Bluetooth menu, and you had a reset Bluetooth module option. It's no longer in the menu 
even with the keyboard commands, uh, modifiers. So I found uh, where somebody posted the terminal command to do the same thing. I, had, I didn't try it yet uh, because it then because it, it started working. <laughs> so it goes back and forth. <laughs> all right, that's all I have. Unfor well, that's all we have time for. I have a lot more. <laughs> Windows 11 has had very few issues because you have to have new hardware. There you go. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Thanks again for coming. How about this? I'll play my last slide. Oh, the HDMI sound's not going through. <laughs> Have a happy Thanksgiving, everybody.